get going. Good evening, everybody. It is 6.30 or very close to it, so we are going to go ahead and start. And there are chairs available, so we will point those out to people. Um, Peter and Liz, there are chairs up here as people come in, so if we can keep getting them in and get them to the front, that would be great. Well, my name is Paul Esser. I'm the mayor of the city of Sun Prairie, and I am here on official duty to introduce our person of the hour, our person of the day. And I want to begin by thanking you all for coming. I'm so impressed to see so many people here. I should not be surprised that there would be many people that would want to be here. But you're just never sure what's going to happen as you do these events and you talk them up around the community. Now there's several more people coming in. So there are plenty of seats right up front, Lisa. So <laughs> not to encourage you to come up here. But uh, no, you've got to come with her. So Gary, so good. <laughs> Good evening. Well, again, thank you to everybody for being here this evening. It is so nice to be here. I struggled with this introduction, not because I have a hard time with this person. This person is somebody that I've known well and have a great deal, a very great deal of respect for. But I've had a hard time knowing what title I'm supposed to use. I have the privilege and honor to introduce him. But I'm not sure if I should be referring to this, gen this gentleman as Mr. Ambassador, or Mr. Speaker, or Regent, or any of the other titles that uh, uh, would become due to him. And I'm, I'm sure that there are other ones as well. But uh, using those titles fails to recognize the essence of this man. Uh, it, and the essence is that he is one of us. Uh, his history is the history of us and of our community of Sun Prairie. And so much of what he has achieved in life is uh, what you see here in the exhibit about us. And it belongs to all of us. In the end, he is one of us. And he belongs to all of us in this community. He used to be. He used what he learned here in Sun Prairie to move in the world beyond him. And the man I'm about to introduce has been the speaker of the Wisconsin State Assembly. He was President uh, Clinton's Wisconsin campaign manager. He was a member of the Wisconsin Board of Regents, a candidate for governor of the state of Wisconsin, and of course, uh, the ambassador, the United States ambassador to Norway. Any one, any one of those would have been an achievement of a lifetime for any one of us. And yet for this person, he has all of those and other titles and other activities as well. And as I go about Sun Prairie, I'm always telling people that this person is the second most prominent person to come out of Sun Prairie after George O'Keefe. It's hard to top George O'Keefe. But after George O'Keefe, our person is going to be the next person in line. And I consider him to be a friend of mine. He and I have traveled some of the same paths, although mine has been much lower and closer to the ground. And in some ways, I think of us as fellow travelers. So I'm keeping you all in suspense of the person that I am here to introduce this evening. So let me move right to that. I am introducing and presenting to you this evening Mr. Tom Loftus, my friend. Thank you, Tom, for being here. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Mayor Esser. Uh, Paul is on his second go-round as mayor of Sun Prairie. He was the mayor when I was in the legislature. And I want you to know that every February 2nd, when the two of us were with the groundhog, uh, spring was coming early. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Carol Iwanowski of the library who has uh, really worked to help set up this exhibit. Uh, Peter Klein, uh, Mr. History of Sun Prairie. Peter, where are you? Back, here. Back there, yes. Uh, 
A special thanks, uh, in fact, the a real person who put this together and coordinated it is Sue Meyer here, my assistant, my friend, and you're not going to believe this, uh, she has uh, been with me since 1978. So what all of these successes I've had, she's been along. Uh, thank you to my wife, Joanne, over next to the mayor. Uh, my son, Alec, who is not here but is watching uh, on uh, Wisconsin Eye from Chicago. Uh, thanks to Tamar Myers, the reporter for the Sun Prairie Star Countryman, who did an excellent job, uh, a UW-Madison journalism major, a graduate. Uh, David Wright is here. Uh, he is the development officer of the Norwegian American Genealogical Center in Naseth Library in Madison. And you will see a little more about them in the display. Uh, but Professor Naseth, who has since passed away, was from this area, and he is uh, buried at uh, Spring Prairie Lutheran Church in Kaiser. So he is a very important part of the Norwegian immigrant history of this state. Um, Sweta Hetzer, our new library director, and I'm introducing her. She's in the back of the room, and she's going to wave. Uh, and she invites you all to take a look at this beautiful library, which is uh, something that the whole city of Sun Prairie is very proud of. Um, a couple of friends here, Tom Hebel, uh, who had the good sense to lose to me in a primary election in 1976 so I could start my career, and former Mayor uh, Joe Chase. So thank all of you for coming. Well, Wisconsin Eye is here tonight. Wisconsin Eye is a television network that uh, televises live legislative sessions and committee sessions of the legislature. It was started by myself and former Governor Lee Sherman Dreyfus. And it's not unusual because former Governor Dreyfus was a communications professor at Madison, went on to become the chancellor of Stevens Point University, then went on to become the governor of Wisconsin. And you'll see in the display a photo of me in Shanghai in 1983, shaking hands with children. You never know. They could be voters one day. Uh, I'm, I'm the tallest person in Shanghai, there is no doubt about it, in 1983. This was a famous trade mission that Governor Dreyfus led, and I was with him. This was very shortly after Nixon had opened up China. In fact, um, there were no real hotels, uh, and Governor Dreyfus slept in Nixon's bed, and I slept in Kissinger's bed. And the, the eavesdropping equipment was still there, right <laughs> under the table. All right, the display uh, starts with the history of the immigration of the Loftus family. And you see here, they all came from Norway. Not one was born here. And my grandfather is the handsome fellow on the left on the lower side. And he's called Edward here. But his name was Eivind. And his father, Ole Loftus, that actually wasn't his name. They came to the United States. They left on July 4th, 1885. They got on a ship called the Katie, a German vessel that left from Stockholm. They came to New York before Ellis Island was open. So they went, came to the immigration center before Ellis Island. And I can just see the scene because his name was Ole Olson. And I can just see the immigration officers. We, we've got way too many Ole Olsons from <laughs> Norway. You, can you think of something else? So he said, Loftus. 
which Luft Hoos, L-O-F-T-H-U-S. That's the farm they came from. So that name is just the name of the farm. And the farm had a house on it with a loft. So there's the name Loftus. Now they had to drop the H from Loft Thus to Loft Tus. So there, there you have it. That's how they came. And as you can deduce, uh, my father was a beneficiary of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution that says that those who were born here from immigrant parents are citizens. So I watched that issue with some uh, interest. Now, the research done for this display and the immigration of my particular family is by the Norwegian American Genealogical Center in Madison, just off the square. It is the leading research source for Norwegian immigration in the United States. And it's a jewel in our midst, and it's right in, in Madison. So the first thing in the display that you see is sort of my mother and father and sisters and uh, a little description that in 1949 we moved here from Stoughton, where Ole and the gang went after they left New York. And my father uh, became a partner with Lou Brooks in uh, what is now Brooks Tractor on Main Street, uh, one of the oldest uh, businesses still existing in Sun Prairie. You'll see my picture on the Sun Prairie golf team. The requirement to be on that team is that you had to own your own golf clubs. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a start, and that was the first year of the Sun Prairie Golf Course, 1962. So I had the great honor to play uh, out there on the 50th anniversary of that golf course. Then you'll see a picture of me as a military policeman. Uh, I had gone to the University of Wisconsin Whitewater. Well, actually, I'd want, I've gone to Whitewater State College then. I flunked out, and the reward for flunking out then was that you were drafted. <laughs> so I was drafted and uh, went into the Army, and um, my group was scheduled to go to Viet Vietnam, but I was in the hospital, sick as could be with pneumonia. I missed the cycle. They went, I stayed in the hospital. So how do you get to be a military policeman? Well. They just lined us up and they took the six tallest people in the line and said, you're military policemen. And I was sent to El Paso, Texas to Fort Bliss uh, on the Rio Grande River and not one Viet Cong came over that river the whole time I was there. <laughs> All right, so I ran for the assembly in 1976 from, from Sun Prairie and as I mentioned, my friend and, and lawyer, uh, Tom Hebel was was uh, in that primary election. And that was the election Carter was uh, elected. And shortly after that, well, 10 years after that, after I was speaker and in 1990, I decided to run for governor. Tommy Thompson had just finished his first term. So um, I entered that race for governor. And as you can see, I'm the guy on the left <laughs> with some hair. Uh, Tommy is the guy on the right with black hair. That's changed completely. And we have the uniform on, red ties, dark suits, white shirt. That's what we did. Well, I wasn't the right choice, as it turned out. Uh, I came in second. And that was, uh, that was the start of, of the adventure to becoming named nominated to be ambassador to Norway. Um, we had a debate. And I was at, we were both asked, would we serve out our full term 
if we were elected? And I said yes, with the exception, if I were to become the ambassador to Norway, I wouldn't. Prescient uh, comment, but I was being a little flip at the time. But things come to pass. Um, I had become quite good friends with Governor Clinton. We were in politics together. We were in a movement to make the Democratic Party a little more uh, centrist. Um, he had supported me for governor. I, I said, said to him in a weak moment one day, if you ever think about running for president, give me a call. <laughs> well, he did. And I chaired his campaign in Wisconsin that year. Well, I did not want to go to Washington. I was exhausted. I had no desire to go to the partisan pit of Washington after all of these years in politics here. So I um, went to Washington in uh, February of 1993. Uh, Clinton had just been inaugurated and sworn in in January. So I was there in February. You can imagine a lot of work went into this meeting. Uh, to meet with him at the White House. And the two of us just could not believe that we were both in that room after all of this and you actually get elected president. So as politicians do say to one another, I, I said, actually I didn't give him any choices. I said, I would like to be nominated to be the ambassador to Norway. This is the worst thing that you can ask for of another politician because you have left that person no way out. <laughs> and he said, well, we could probably work that out. And anything in politics that isn't yes is a no. But he did say that. <clears throat> so I left the office after he had given me a tour of where his allergy medicine was kept and <clears throat> the rug and, I, you know, this is, here's the view. And he had my file, and he wrote on it, and it went to the personnel office. And well, we heard nothing, and my friends in the White House had heard nothing, and people were inquiring. He had written on the file, not a bad idea, meaning go ahead with this and, and investigate him and do the research. A staff person had taken it and read it to say, no, a bad idea. <laughs> so my file went on the bad stack. Finally, this came to pass and it got on the good stack and I went through the process with the State Department, the White House, and I was to be sent to the Senate. And uh, President Clinton, not an organized fellow uh, at all, and the White House was pretty much followed his example. I had one day for my nomination to go to the Senate to be in the earliest cycle, and he had to sign the paper. And he was on the golf course in Martha's Vineyard, and I had a friend of mine take a golf cart out who worked for him with my paper, sign it, bring it back, fax it to the State Department, and I got into the Senate in that mix. Then what happens? I'm nominated. And one of the senators puts a hold on me. In other words, they say, I'm, a, I'm, I'm not letting this nomination go forward. Well, what, I, what had I done? Well, a lot, but not to, to that. Uh, well, who was this senator? Never heard of him. Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Honestly, I'd never heard of him. He had an issue where he wanted some staff people from the State Department fired. And he was holding me hostage as leverage to get them fired. The Democrats controlled the Senate at the time, and they, they still couldn't move my nomination. But a deal was finally worked out, and I was on my way to Norway, arrived uh, October of 19. 93, and one of the 
important things to know when you're going to a country, especially with my background, is, is the history of the country and what you're getting into. This is a picture of the Norwegian Constitutional Convention at Eidsvold in 1814. We call this Sittenamai. We think it's Norwegian Independence Day, but it's not. That came in 1905 when they separated from uh, Sweden in an amicable way. Uh, they had been, uh, <clears throat> Sweden had been on the wrong side of one of the Napoleonic Wars and uh, Norway was let go, something like that. But so much of modern Norway history, society, culture, to this day is shaped by their experience in World War II. And it's so important to know that experience. The Germans had a surprise attack on Norway in April of 1940. No declaration of war, nothing. A surprise attack. In the middle of the night, they sent the battleship Blucher up the Oslo Harbor, Oslo Fjord, excuse me, with the force to take over Oslo and <coughs> declare Norway a friendly ally of Nazi Germany headed by a fifth columnist inside Norway, Quisling. Their objective was to occupy the city and the country, capture the king, and put Quisling in power. They didn't count on this guy named Commander Andreas being at the battalion in the Oslo Fjord. And he had no orders. He didn't know what was going on. But he sunk the ship. There was 2,300 German troops on that ship. 200 survived. Well, that delayed the invasion long enough that the king and the royal family were able to go north. The king was uh, taken away uh, by a British destroyer. And uh, the queen and the children, including the current king, left with the American ambassador in a car caravan where they headed out of Oslo into Sweden to try and escape capture. Her name was Florence Jaffrey Harriman. She took the code books out of the embassy safe and put them in her bra, thinking that no, no, no German officer would dare search her. She went the whole way with the current king, the mother, into Sweden, and Roosevelt sent a ship for them in northern Finland and took them, that family, back to Washington. The king and his son went to London and became the Norwegian government in exile. Now, she had a long history. Here she's advocating for the women's right to vote. And at a campaign rally for Woodrow Wilson, who was against the women's right to vote until it looked like he was going to lose, and then he was for it. <laughs> and uh, she was there. I don't know how that happens. Um, the job of the ambassador is to know the president's foreign policy, and you, you, you almost have to know it instinctively through your own life and experiences and your teaching. Uh, I fortunately had my Aunt Eileen as my history teacher at the Sunbury High School, so I was all set. <laughs> You have to establish credibility and trust, and you have to be a professional friend. And you can't just be with the party in power in a country. You have to be friends and have relationships with all of the parties. So what happened after the king, the current king, went to the White House? He lived with Roosevelt. Here he's playing, there he's playing with Roosevelt's dog, Fala. So I'll get back to that. But you can see the connection between the United States and the, the history of this country 
and, and the uh, monarchy. Part of that history is that they became a, a charter member of NATO after the war. They were one of the original members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. A lot of things happen. Uh, okay, it's still playing with Prince Harold's dog. We can. <laughs> all right. Now let's go to modern Norway. This is this is a view of of from the Arctic down. You see Norway on the left, and Sweden. That's a, that's the Nordic Peninsula there. That red line is going through the Arctic Ocean, and that is now a new sea route because of the melting of Arctic ice. So that is an open route, about six months of year, where transport, mostly oil and bulk materials, go from Europe to China. It's about a third of the distance of going through the Suez Canal, and it is it is important not only to the Norwegians but the rest of the world because this has become a new seaway. The Russians think of this as their Suez Canal. And this is very important to Norway's current political situation. Then you see um, where Norway is and the, and the Arctic Circle. If you go right up at the top and you see the brown to the east of Finland, that's Russia. So Russia and Norway have a, a border. It used to be the border between Norway and the Soviet Union. At that border um, is Murmansk. It's a city of 500,000 people, and it is where the Soviet, now the Russian nuclear submarines are the ones that were going to blow us the smithereens. And this is the only Russian ice-free port on the Atlantic. So it is so crucial to everything. It's also where their ballistic missiles are. Now, you'll see the Gulf Stream here in a minute. All right. Why is that an ice-free port? Well, because the Gulf Stream leaves Florida, goes the North Atlantic goes over the top of the United Kingdom and hits right about where Murmansk is. Then it turns around and, and comes back. So as far as a strategic part of the world for both the United States, the West, and the Russians, this is extremely important. Um, here you have a view, of, again, from the Arctic, and you'll see Bear Island. And in the display, you'll see that I become a member of the Polar Bear Club on Bear Island. <laughs> and uh, we, I was with the Norwegian rescue helicopter who were taking me on a trip to Svalbard, which is governed by Norway but not part of Norway. It's from a World War I treaty. I couldn't go there on my own, so they took me and I was visiting the gover governor. It was my 50th birthday. We stopped at Bear Island. Seven people lived there. It's a weather station. They baked me a cherry cake, but the deal was I had to join the polar bear club. So I had to jump in the Arctic Ocean, and you had to have your head underwater, and you had to swim two laps, which that's a lot, while one of them stood guard with a rifle because there are polar bears everywhere. <laughs> And then you come out and you jump in the sauna when your feet are clogged with ice at that time because you have to run from the ocean up a, a, and whatever. Anyway, that's, someone asked, how, how did that happen? Well, it happened. It, it happens, <laughs> happens to everybody, doesn't it, I'm sure? Um, we then look back at the northern sea route, the new route from Europe to Asia. This is a Russian nuclear icebreaker. They have 12 of them. We have one icebreaker in this country. They're building another 12. That's about as tall as the rotunda at the Capitol in Madison, that ship, the peak. Um, the next slide you'll see the icebreaker is 
is escorting an oil tanker through this route on its way to Japan and um, China. Here is one of their icebreakers, and they're taking tourists to the North Pole. So that is at the North Pole. This thing breaks through the ice and stops at the North Pole, and people pay 25000 a pop for that. Now, I was in Vermont several times, and this icebreaker was my hotel. The captain was my host, and I was there visiting a uh, low-level liquid nuclear nuclear uh, radioactive waste storage facility. We were trying to negotiate a treaty with the Russians that I was the bleed on so they wouldn't dump this in the Arctic Ocean. We were negotiating a deal that, of course, we would pay something for storage. So I to toured this ship full of radioactive waste. And the protection was a white coat and then some, something that looked like a meat thermometer. <laughs> and I had dinner with the captain that night, and he said, are you crazy? Well, then he said, at least you'll never need another battery for your watch. <laughs> <laughs> Heck of a guy had a hammer and sickle tattooed right there. Um, Norway discovered oil uh, off its coast in the North Sea in the 60s. This is oil that is pumped out and shipped. Uh, at one time, they were the third largest export, oil exporting country in the world. That's oil exporting, because they don't consume any oil themselves, really. However, what is important now is the natural gas. This is the system of pipelines that run underneath the ocean from Norway to Europe and the UK. These are huge pipelines that are built underwater, and there's bridges and spans that hold them up. This is important because this is the basic uh, alternative to gas from Russia for Europe. So Norway again becomes very strategic in the whole Ukraine, Russia, uh, and uh, uh, Gazprom. It's an amazing system, and uh, you can see where it goes into Germany at, at Emden. Then it goes into the European pipeline, and it goes all, all over Europe, it's including Ukraine. That's what's left. <clears throat> that little patch of ice in that polar bear, all the rest is melted. <laughs> but uh, it is a very serious situation there. The, the spring ice comes earlier. The winter ice leaves later. Uh, the ice is more brittle. Um, and we see uh, the next sort of hot spot of the world in this, this cold area. All right. So I, uh, I come to Norway and I present my credentials to His Majesty the King. Why do you present, as an American ambassador, to present your con credentials to a monarch? Because he is the head of state. The prime minister is the head of government, a temporary position that can change with the elections. It's the, it's the monarch is the head of state. Here, the president is both the head of state and the head of government. So that is why you do uh, that. And then we had, I want to talk about three events when I was in Norway. Uh, one very pleasant, and that was the 1994 Lillehammer Olympics. And um, this is a nightmare for almost any ambassador from any country that is in the country that has happened to, to have the Olympics because about 800 uninvited guests show up and you're responsible for them. And fortunately, Hillary Clinton, First Lady Hillary Clinton, came to lead the US delegation. I had known her for a long time. We spent five days uh, together, uh, freezing in Lillehammer. Um, this, this was the Olympics where 
Tonya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan were going to beat each other bloody. Uh, I went to that event. Uh, it didn't happen, but I could get no one else to go with me but my son Alec, who was only 10. What did he know? Um, but it was a very successful Olympics and put Norway in, on the map of the world as a very uh, efficient country that could pull this off and it had, had, has paid uh, great dividends. Um, it's a lot of uh, work. Um, you, you're the ambassador and you're not only the host of this official delegation, you're kind of responsible for all of the Americans uh, and you hope that, you know, the press acts right and whatever. But in this delegation was a fellow from Louisville, Kentucky. He was the newspaper editor and uh, a friend of the Clintons, a good old boy, uh, but, you know, a very, very nice guy. And we were uh, at the uh, ski jump and um, the Olympics had been going so well. And uh, he, was, he was enthused. He, he wanted to tell the Norwegians how impressed he was, or how well they were doing. And we were in the VIP tent. And a whisper came up, comes up and says, there's the king, there's the king, there's the king. This guy jumps up from the seat, just one away from me, and goes for this fellow. I couldn't stop him. What was I going to do? He goes up to this person that says, king. <laughs> You are one, this is a wonderful country, you're wonderful, a great Olympics, this is terrific. Uh, and uh, the person said, well, <laughs> you're very welcome, but I'm the king of Spain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't get more American than that. Uh, okay. Uh, the other two events are the Nobel Peace Prize is given in Norway by a Norwegian Nobel Committee. The other, the other Nobel Prizes are given in Sweden. The Peace Prize was granted to Norway by Alfred Nobel because he thought the Swedes were very warring people. Now, Alfred Nobel was a munitions manufacturer, so <laughs> had something to do with this. Um, but So the Norwegians were given this honor to bestow this prize, and there's, it's, it's come to mean a lot of uh, not only money and, and recognition, but power. It's become a powerful prize to change things. So what happens to me? I, I arrive in Oslo in October of 1993, and the Peace Prize is announced is being given to Nelson Mandela and Willem de Klerk. This is before South Africa became an independent country. De Klerk was the president of the apartheid government. They shared the prize. And the idea was there had to be a transition coming up and, and the Nobel Prize would help with this transition. The prize is given December 10th in the Oslo City Hall, a beautiful place. And I uh, was waiting to go over there in my office. I was, it was about noon. The prize is awarded at one, and then there's a lecture. And Sue Meyer, my assistant, who's sitting in the next office, yes, she came to Norway with me, um, rang into my telephone and said, Nelson Mandela is on the phone. Well, I had no doubt it was him, but my first reaction, now, what did we do? What, what, what did the United States do? I mean, no, I, no one tells me anything. <laughs> I just got here. Um, so I pick up the phone, and he said this, Mr. Ambassador, what an honor to talk to you. And. We chatted a bit and he said, could you be in my suite in the Grand Hotel one hour after the Nobel Prize ceremonies end? And I said, well, of course I certainly can be. So I went to the ceremony, heard the speech. I was there in the Grand Hotel on Carl Johans Gate in Oslo, went up to his room, 
uh, just the two of us. And I swear to you, when I walked in their room, there was a aura, there was a calm over everything. And he offered me tea. I never drank a cup of tea in my life, but of course I had tea <laughs> and with milk in it. Um, and he had, he had notes uh, that he was reading from. And neither one of us knew much what either what was going on. But he, the gist of it was that in South Africa that week were the negotiations going on for the general agreement on tariff and trade. This became the World Trade Organization. This was the negotiations that led up to that. The United States was insisting that textiles, clothing manufacture uh, from certain countries, including South Africa, could no longer enjoy their tariff status. In other words, so they would be cheaper than other clothes. And Mandela said, if this happens, I'll lose 100,000 jobs, and I haven't even become the president yet. So I called the secret number. Yes, there's a secret number. And I said, I need the US trade representative in South Africa, who's in South Africa negotiating. I need him on the phone right now. 10 minutes later, he calls the hotel suite. Thank God it's a guy named Mickey Cantor, who I knew I was in the campaign with. And I said, Mickey, I'm in Oslo in the Grand Hotel in Nelson Mandela's suite. He has just won the Nobel Peace Prize, and he wants the United States to change its position on textiles, and I said we would. Here, I'll put him on the phone. <laughs> Mickey calls, so the next day, I'm back in the suite with Nelson Mandela. Nick, Mickey calls, all right, we'll do it. But no word to the press. So we did it. I immediately wrote a note to the president saying, no, don't fire Mickey. This was what happened and whatnot. But it, it's an illustration of what you have to do as an ambassador. You are the only one representing the United States in the country that can speak for the White House, the State Department, the government. And you have the ability to make a decision like that. I mean, you might have to pay dearly for it, uh, but uh, it was the right thing to do. And um, it, was, it was important that we did it because he needed, Nelson Mandela needed, when he became president, all the help he could get because they were obviously ready to say he's a failure after a short period of time. The second Nobel Peace Prize, someone is not, lit, not in this picture, it's Yasser Arafat, Shimon Peres, and uh, Rabin. Rabin was the president of Israel. Um, Peres was the foreign minister. Yasser Arafat was the head of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. In the display, you'll see a picture of myself and Arafat where he is, we are shaking hands. Um, the Oslo Accords were brokered in Oslo and endorsed by the United States, Israel, and the Palestinians. It was the breakthrough in 1993 that was going to lead to peace between Israel and the Palestinians. The Norwegians, in, in a, a move that wasn't that transparent, awarded the peace prize to these three people to push them, to say, now you're Nobel laureates, you've signed this thing, now do it, you have a special status. So the picture you say in the display is an official dinner where Arafat comes to Oslo and I'm the first American ambassador that he's going to see after he got off the terrorist list. Um, <laughs> I, the, my work in the assembly had prepared me for this. Uh, there's no doubt. <laughs> so he comes into the dinner, and, and uh, there were, I had no instructions, of course. Um, and he grabs my hand to shake it, and then grabs my arm so I couldn't 
let go and we stood there until every cameraman and photographer that was there had all of their uh, pictures. And the unfortunate thing is what I was witnessing, I was with Perez and Arafat several times over the next couple of years. Each time I, w I was with them, I wasn't to negotiate, I was to deliver a message, hear what they had to say, and then send that message back. And what I was witnessing was the falling apart of this peace accord. We thought it was the putting together of it, but it was the falling apart. And then sadly, uh, the president of Israel, um, Rabin was assassinated. And uh, Netanyahu came to office, and despite pledging fealty to the Oslo Accords, it didn't, and they, they went by the wayside. And we're, we're still back uh, to that part today. Okay, last uh, great story is the king and queen became the king and queen when I was there. The father had, King Olaf had passed away. They became, he be, they became the king and queen. So it came time for their, their first ever state visit to the United States. Now remember I said the monarchy is the head of state. The state visit, he is, he, he is to come to pay his respects to President Clinton. Uh, I am the, their host in the United States, travel with the two of them for three weeks. You'll see in the display a picture of me dancing with the Queen at the Waldorf Astoria. The first event is we come to New York. There's a dinner for the King and Queen. My job is to toast their majesties on behalf of the President and lead the dancing with the Queen. Fine. Uh, we start out and it's a very slow waltz and I thought, boy, when this is over, I'll, I'm, it'll be good. Um, <laughs> the band doesn't stop playing. It doesn't take a break. It just goes into another faster jitterbug type song. <laughs> what am I going to do? Leave the queen there saying, uh, <laughs> so we're out there. And neither one of us can actually leave until this band stops. But it all worked out. And we ended up at the White House for the state dinner in the private dining room of the president. It's the president, the first lady, the secretary of state, um, Vice President Gore, um, it's a small group, our spouses, I'm forgetting who else is, is there. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm quite nervous because the king was a smoker. And there is no smoking in the White House, even if you're a king. Uh, so I had to negotiate with the White House and a, a break up, a break in the dinner so the king could have a cigarette. So what President Clinton did was say, Your Majesty, why don't you come out here to the balcony and I will show you the Washington skyline. And that was the signal to light up. <laughs> and God bless Clinton, he had a cigar out there as, as well. Um, you'll see in the display a medal, the Royal Norwegian Order of Merit. It's a very high honor and their majesties gave it to me for my service to Norway, not my service to the United States. But uh, I, it had a lot to do with that time we were together and traveled together. You'll see the ambassador's flag with 13 stars on it that is given to ambassadors when they retire. It's a very unique and historical flag. You'll see, um, let's, here's the, 
go back one, too. Here's Gro Harlem Brundtland on the right. She was the Prime Minister of Norway when I was there, a very prominent Prime Minister in the whole world. And when I left uh, my post in 1998, she had just been elected to head the World Health Organization, which is part of the United Nations. And she asked me to go with her to be her political and diplomatic advisor. And I did. Uh, so I left the State Department. I went to be an official with the United Nations. And I was her political and diplomatic advisor for uh, seven years. And the World Health Organization is, is headquartered in Geneva. And I handled our relations in Washington and went back and forth to Geneva. Our relationship was with the State Department, the IMF, the World Bank, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, none other than Tommy G. Thompson. <laughs> We're like bad pennies with each other. We, I mean, we, we um, So I'm going to wrap things up and, and just digress a little bit how it is, how it come that, why am I stumbling all over the world and why am I doing this? What, what happened? And, um, well, the thing that happened is that the first foreign country I went to, I walked. I was in El Paso, a military policeman. We had our first weekend off, and I walked across the bridge into Juarez, Mexico. And just that little walk across that bridge, you went to a different world. The United States wasn't the center of the world. They had their own issues. It was a wonderful civilization and culture. Uh, at the time, the United States Army, this was the first wartime experience of an integrated army. Uh, there was a lot of remnants of racism, especially in El Paso, for soldiers. And all of us liked Juarez a lot better. So that stuck with me. And ever since then, I have made a pledge to myself that I'll use my passport every two years, and I, I did that, uh, and I worked at it. And it's, it's going there is the important thing. If you put off till the next time, well, maybe we better go next year, or wouldn't the weather be somewhere else? If you get an opportunity, go. And some amazing things uh, have happened. And when I was in China with uh, Governor Dreyfus, we were in the Hollywood Arms Hotel in Shanghai. And Governor Dreyfus's uh, brother had been shot down uh, by the Japanese in World War II over China. And the Chinese had saved him and took him out. And he ended up at the, this Beverly Hills Hotel <clears throat> in Shanghai. We went there. and. Um, the other group that was there was a, a rather inebriated crowd from Notre Dame. <laughs> and they were playing the Notre Dame fight song on the piano in the bar. And Governor Dreyfus got up and he walked over there and he sat down and started to play on Wisconsin. <laughs> um, that was the same trip that I had my first experience with um, Peking duck at a restaurant where the first course was duck tongue soup. And then the rest of the innards and skin and everything follows after that. But it was a great experience because the duck tongues came from a poultry farm in Racine, Wisconsin. <laughs> No market for duck tongues <laughs> here, but there. So this idea of the integrated world was starting to kick effect. That was the same trip where as, a pres where as gifts, we bought beer, not knowing the Germans had been there 100 years ago and they, had, they were good on beer. And we bought cheese. 
we bought cheese to, for, as a gift for one billion lactose intolerant people. <laughs> So thank God we had someone on the trip with us who ran the ginseng growing operation in Marathon County, Wausau. We, none of us knew what ginseng was. He presented a gift to the Chinese after our cheese and our beer. Bring, it, bring in a can of Schlitz to China. Anyway, well, their eyes widened and our status grew and it was well known even then, 1983, there, there were hardly street lights in Beijing, hardly cars, it was dark. Um, the status of Wisconsin ginseng was, was the only thing they knew about Wisconsin. There was one other thing, and that is we had a reception, and you know, there, everyone was spying on you, and uh, so what? Uh, but, you get used to that. I, uh, the Russian ambassador and I had lunch every month in Oslo. We would trade places and we talked. We became good friends. And I said to him once when we were in our residence, I said, I suppose you have this place bugged. He said, yeah, but they don't work. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing worked at that time at the, for the Russians. But. Um, these experiences um, are, are important. Uh, I had met Shimon Perez, the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, when I went to Israel with Governor Thompson on a trade mission. And so I had met him before. And this was, happened quite often. If you get around, you'll meet people. Um, met Paul McCartney on the beach when one day in Jamaica, well, he was there, I was there. I mean, he had to be somewhere, I had to be somewhere. <laughs> and there we were. Um, I'm gonna wind up and happy to answer any questions. I've only covered a few things. What you see in the exhibit is, covers a lot more. But um, golf has been my avocation and it's, you know, we got, my wife is at St. Andrews, and this is a trophy she has for getting an eagle on the second hole. So there you have it. Uh, it all comes down to that. I want to, I want to say, um, uh, in closing, a big thank you to the museum in Sun Prairie, the library, all of the people that worked on the exhibit. And I repeat myself that you should take the opportunity to look at the jewel of our city, and that is our library. And thank you very much for coming. A uh, few questions and then we'll, we'll have coffee and uh, we'll have coffee. Uh, anybody? Okay. Yeah. What about the language Norwegian kind of stuff in our state? The question is the, the language. Well, two things. Um, all of the diplomatic work is done in English for a good reason for fear that the translation, something would, would be wrong, be out of context. So even though our, in our embassy we had a lot of Norwegian speakers, um, everything was done in English, and the Norwegians did all of their diplomatic work in English as well. So if they were with the Germans, or if they were the Swedes, whatever, now this is to make sure that the record is accurate and that a, a word is not translated in air. Now, I, I did learn Norwegian, and one of my Norwegian friends said, why? Um, there are only four million Norwegian speakers, but um, I did. And the important part was not, I, I, had to give, I had to give a speech in 
Norwegian on the 4th of July at our party where we had 800 people in the garden. Well, I had practiced this speech forever, and those 800 people told 8,000 people that I was fluent in Norwegian. <laughs> uh, that's all it took. But I, but I could read the papers, and I could do a casual conversation, and the important thing was that I had made the effort. Uh, there, there have been quite a few famous people that have come through the embassy in Oslo. John Kerry was there as a child. His father was there. Julia Child was there. Her husband was in the information agency at the embassy, and Julia gave cooking lessons at the residence. Um, anything else? John, uh, your sister uh, Wendy still lives over there. She must have fell in love with the country. Uh, yes, my sister Wendy, who is uh, also a graduate of Sun Prairie High School and the University of Wisconsin at Madison, um, married a Norwegian, and she's lived there for uh, about 35 years, has a son. She was just returned. Was she in your class, yes. Joe? She was in your class. Um, and I have uh, uh, close cousins. If we could go back to that, well, no, no matter. All right, here's the last one. On, on my grandmother's side, this is my grandfather's side that we've been talking about. On my grandmother's side, there were seven children. Six of them immigrated to the United States. The seventh, a girl, a teenager, was going to go with them. And before they were to go, they were in church. And her boyfriend was sitting behind her, and he said, please don't go. And she didn't go. She had seven children, and all of thou seven and their children are now my relatives, and we see them, and so I was quite, felt quite at home when I was there. Okay, thank you very much.